thank you for coming, and uh, we're going to hear more about the top secret alien abduction files um, from Nick Redfern, who's now written well over 50 books. So give it up for our guest of honor tonight, Nick Redfern. And um, I'm here to talk to you tonight about the alien abduction phenomenon, but with a little bit of a twist on it. Um, I doubt there's anybody in the audience who hasn't heard of alien abductions at all. Um, but there's this sort of weird angle which suggests that many of the abductees, particularly the more well-known ones, the ones that are in the public domain and lecturing and writing books, have been subjected to what we might call surveillance, um, which obviously is growing in today's world with social media being monitored and so forth. And it's a very unusual and controversial aspect of the alien abduction phenomenon, which is controversial enough to start with. So what I'm going to do for you is talk about some of the more intriguing cases that relate to this issue of someone possibly within government taking a deep interest in the abduction phenomenon for reasons that we don't necessarily know, but there could be a number of potential scenarios. Now, to give you a little bit of background, um, I'm someone who has a deep interest in the UFO subject, but who has never actually seen a UFO. Uh, but how I got interested in the UFO subject was because my father was in the British Royal Air Force in the 1950s. This was when the UK still had the, the uh, UK equivalent of the draft in place. So we did uh, about four years in the military. And he worked as a radar mechanic at a Royal Air Force base on the <coughs> east coast of England called Royal Air Force Meters Head. And he told me a story when I was about 11 or 12 years old, which I guess in many respects sort of transformed my outlook on the world and the issue of UFOs as well, which I hadn't really given much thought to prior to that particular time. Now, what basically happened was September 1952, and it was a height of a, a NATO exercise called the Main Brace. And the ground crew um, at the Air Force Base that he was stationed at at the time were scrambled into the skies to, in essentially what they thought they were gonna uh, come up against was uh, Russian aircraft. The radar operators were tracking these strange, fast-moving, high-flying objects coming in from um, Europe towards the east coast of England. And the first thought was, because it was a NATO exercise, well, it's got to be the Russians flexing their muscles and just putting a show of power on, in the same way that NATO was with the exercise as well. But as the pilots got closer and closer to these objects, they could see that they clearly were not aircraft, or at least not normal aircraft. Some of the pilots reported seeing what looked like just huge balls of light, extremely bright light. One of them described it, if you imagine like a camera flash, which obviously goes on and off, but if you imagine something of the brightness and the intensity of a camera flash, but staying open all the time, that's how bright these lights were. Other pilots uh, reported seeing what we would call classic flying saucers, if you like. And this went on for three nights and the pilot would be sent up, try to intercept them, but they just could not keep up with whatever these objects were. And so, after the third night of activity, um, everybody that was involved, the pilots, the ground crew, the radar operators, and the um, radar mechanics, like my father, they were all taken into a room and told, you know, you won't talk about this. And that the British government has something called the Official Secrets Act. And the Official Secrets Act is a piece of legislation which is designed to prevent people who work or have worked within government or the military uh, not to talk about things that they're not supposed to talk about. And my dad didn't actually say anything about this, as I said, until I was about 11 or 12. And he told me this entire story. And it really got me interested in the UFO subject not just because it was my own dad who had this experience, 
but also because he was trained in the military and he had this background in the military um, working on radar. So, you know, when you hear a story like that from a, from a family member, from your own father, it really does kind of resonate and um, an impact on you, you know, and that's exactly what happened. And, um, and when I left school, um, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. I wasn't the greatest student, put it that way, put it diplomatically. <laughs> and, um, but I got, uh, when I finished school, I began working on a music um, magazine back in England called Zero. And um, they basically sort of taught me from the ground upwards. And it was sort of interviewing bands and going to concerts and research, excuse me, and, and reviewing concerts and that kind of thing. And, um, and I enjoyed doing that. And then I thought after a few years, after the magazine closed down, well, why not try and combine the background in sort of investigative journalism and, and regular journalism that they taught me uh, on the magazine? Why not try and combine that with the interest in the paranormal, things like the UFO subjects, um, and, and other strange phenomena? So that's basically what I've done since then, is to try and look as deeply as possible into the UFO uh, subject to try and find what the truth is. Are we being visited by extraterrestrial? <coughs> Are they something stranger? Are they sort of multi-dimensional? Um, you also have the theory, could they be time travelers from the future? Um, the, the one thing I think I can say more than anything else is that there is a real UFO phenomenon now, what it exactly is, I'm still quite <coughs> open-minded on. Uh, I always tell people that the U in UFO still stands for unidentified. It doesn't stand for alien spaceship. The alien spaceship um, theory is just that, it's a theory. And, and it may well be the answer. Uh, but as I said, there are multiple theories as to what could be going on and what these beings, these entities are. Um, but the phenomenon itself still intrigues me, regardless of what the answer might be. And of course, when we look at this subject, what we find is that there are many, many various aspects to it. You know, you've got alien abductions, uh, you've got contact cases, military encounters like my father's, uh, crop circles. You know, that the list really does go on and on. And so, you know, I try and dig as deeply as I can and I try and keep my own kind of feelings um, out of it. I think the, for me, I think the, um, the, the right way to do it, the responsible way to do it is to share information with you um, and share some of the theories that I've got but not to feel force feed it down your throat that this is what's going on because I think that can really kind of go down dangerous pathways and I mean, you only have to look at some of the UFO cults that have existed in the past where the, the leaders of these groups have almost become like gurus and they've taken over and, and lives have been sort of shattered and destroyed in the process. So I think the responsible way is to sort of share the data and then, you know, we can sort of debate on it and, and try and figure out what the answers are. And I think that's the more responsible way of looking into this. get to the matter of you know, <laughs> uh, when we get to the matter of um, the abductees I always tell people that it's important to note a certain group of people who came before the abductees who were known as the contactees and in some respects there's a, a deep connection or similarity between the abductees and the contactees but there's also a lot of great differences as well. Now, the people who become known as the abductees, they're called the abductees because they've been taken against their will, uh, for want of a better term. The contactees were people who, going back to the early 1950s, claimed very benevolent, friendly encounters with aliens. And this goes back to the early 1950s. And it largely began with a man named George Adamski. 
and that's Adamski there, sort of waving his fingers in a funny way. And um, but George Adamski was one of the very earliest of all the contactees. And to give you sort of a, a quick overview, most of the people who fell into this category of the contactees were people who, late at night, perhaps they had no interest in the UFO subject, but late at night they might feel compelled to go out into like a, an isolated location, a desert location, forests, mountains, that kind of thing. And they didn't really know why they were being, or they felt they should go out to these locations, but they did. And in many of these cases, um, as I said, they had no prior interest in the UFO subject, but that literally kind of changed right overnight. Now, George Adamski was certainly one of the earliest of all the contactees, and probably the most famous, and also the most controversial contactee of all as well. Um, for every believer in Adamski, there's probably five disbelievers in Adamski. Um, but what is significant about George Adamski <coughs> was the impact that he had on the UFO culture in the early 1950s and how, although the phenomenon of flying saucers and the term flying saucers was created in 47, um, so there was sort of about three or four years of sightings and encounters before Adamski came on the scene, but when he did, he really kind of altered certain aspects of ufology overnight. There's, there's no doubt about that, whether people believe him or not. He did have this profound, widespread um, ability to get a lot of people to listen to his story. Now, a lot of what he had to say, frankly, was laughable if you look at back, at, back at it now. He claimed to have met aliens from Venus and Mars who looked very much like us, except that they had long blonde hair and they were sort of sometimes a little bit taller, sometimes a bit shorter. Mm -hmm. Um, and he claimed to have seen aliens out in desert locations, particularly in California, and wrote a number of books over the years. He died in 1965. But as I said, he caught the attention of the general public. But to get to the issue of why there may be government's um, interest in the abductees today, is that we can actually prove that Adamski was of deep interest to the government in the, 19, in the early 1950s. But you might not actually realize until, until the facts come out as to why he was being watched. Oh, excuse me. Now, that's <coughs> me standing next to the famous robot Gort from the movie The Day the Earth Stood Still. That's me, by the way, that's cool. <laughs> and, um, that literally is like a life-size one. It's like on display at the, um, the Roswell Museum that Miles mentioned. And um, the reason I put that up there is because the day the Earth stood still was sort of one of the defining sci-fi movies of the early 1950s. And it was actually quite a, an intelligent movie. It wasn't just sort of... Um, aliens invade and blow us up kind of thing. It was actually a story of how this sort of lone alien visits the Earth and warns the people of Earth that if you don't lay down your atomic weapons and, and change your way of life, we'll do it for you. And if that doesn't work, we'll destroy your planet and everything on it. So it was pretty like a brutal, stark message, but it was a message that hopefully would have sort of resonated with everybody and maybe you know we would have had a peaceful world that was sort of the, the scenario of the day the earth stood still um, and many of the accounts of the contactees were very much like the theme of um, of the day the earth stood still peaceful aliens who wanted us to uh, essentially sort of disarm now a lot of people don't realize this, but George Adamski, um, at one point in his life at least, he may have changed over the years, but he was actually a staunch communist. And um, he was someone who was in his lectures, he would actually talk about how he felt that the, the aliens that he met, the so-called long-haired space brothers, um, he felt that they had sort of a, like a communist type government. And in his lectures, he actually stated 
words to the effect of that one day Russia will rule the world and communism will be the future for everybody on the planet. Now, you have to look at the time frame of this, which was the, the time of like McCarthyism and the so-called Reds under the bed scares where everybody was seeing communists here, there and everywhere. And if, say for example, Adamski was just talking and lecturing to say 20 or 30 people on a Sunday afternoon, probably no one would take any notice of it at all. But that wasn't what happened. Um, combined, Adamski's first two books sold almost a quarter of a million copies by 1960. So a quarter of a million copies of a book or two books on UFOs is, it's a lot of, it's a lot of people reading these books and being influenced by them. And on top of that, you've got the author of the book telling people, well, communism's great, you know. And so bearing again in mind the fact that um, this was all during McCarthyism and the fear of communism in the 50s particularly. And so what happened, this might sound laughable, but the FBI, J. Edgar Hoover, actually opened a file on George Adamski and they wanted to know who this guy was who was talking about UFOs but putting a communist spin on it all. And so they actually opened this file on him. Now, you won't be able to see that too well, but that's one of the pages from the FBI's file on George Adamski. And um, let me just uh, find one bit for you. You, won't be, you might be able to see it at the front, but it says Director FBI, um, 52952. That was just about six months after the file was opened by the FBI. And it's now in the public domain. It's been declassified through the terms of the Freedom of Information Act. And um, the FBI has got a really good website called The Vault. And if you go to The Vault, which is it's vault.gov, they have a section called um, Unexplained Phenomenon. And if you go to there, you can download in PDF form all the FBI's files on UFOs and cattle mutilations and all sorts of weird stuff, uh, which they looked at at one point. And they certainly opened an extensive file on Adamski. And I'll, I'll read one section from you for you. Adamski, during this conversation, made the prediction that Russia will dominate the world and we will then have uh, have an era of peace for 1,000 years. He stated that Russia already has the at at atom bomb and the hydrogen bomb and that the great earthquake which was reported behind the Iron Curtain recently was actually a hydrogen bomb explosion being tried out by the Russians. Adamski states this earthquake broke, excuse me I can't read that bit, but and he added that no normal earthquake can do this. So you've got this man <clears throat> lecturing to thousands and thousands of people, talking about aliens, but saying, hey, they're not just normal aliens, they're communist aliens, and guess what? That's, that's great, that's wonderful. So, you know, it's, it's not, a, it's not it's, it doesn't uh, create any sort of strange scenarios to suggest that he would um, then become what today is known as like a, the subject of a person of interest, you know. Um, you have this situation where the FBI genuinely thought, is he actually just having a deep interest in UFOs and sharing his theories and ideas on politics? Or is he doing this in a sort of a subversive way? And is he possibly even working for the Russians? So that's how this all began with George Adamski um, being the sort of the primary um, contactee and the FBI opening a file on him, not, ne not, not necessarily only for the UFO angle, but also because of this political angle as well. And that really did, even though Adamski didn't realize he was being watched to a great degree, um, we can make a good case that that was really when the, the FBI did begin to look into the private lives and the books and the writings of some of the early people in ufology and it was always it was never really just the ufo angle it was because there was sort of a political aspect to it as well that's another of the um the uh excuse me hang on okay that's not working but um that's another of the um Adamski documents. Uh, again, you can see official memorandum, United States government. And 
you can see there are a few blacked out pages and that's sort of typical in a lot of the material that surfaces through the Freedom of Information Act that um, it's very often blacked out but that's another one that talks about um, Adamski's interest in communism and how the FBI were concerned that possibly again he was trying to influence people and if anybody came knocking on his door like the FBI he could just say well you know I think uh, this is what I think's going on, but we're just talking about UFOs, and, but the FBI was not so sure that that's all there was to it. Now, that's a giant rock in California, which happens to be called Giant Rock. And um, to give you an idea, if I was to stand next to it, I'd probably come to about there. And Giant Rock has sort of a, a legendary role to play again in the early contactee movement and in relation to the FBI. Um, Giant Rock was the place where allegedly a man named George Van Tassel um, had s very similar encounters to George Adamski in the early 1950s and he said like Adamski he felt compelled to go out into the California desert and that's that's probably about a 45 minute drive from Joshua Tree if you wanted to sort of look it up on a map Joshua Tree California and George Van Tassel felt compelled go out to this area and this gleaming slight flying saucer comes down and again out come these long-haired aliens and they like with Adamski told him you know you need to go on the lecture circuit you need to write books you need to get the word out that if you know the human race doesn't change its ways it's going to be annihilation for everybody and instead of writing books um, as George Adamski did what Van Tassel did was to put on a yearly conference out at Giant Rock and um, to give you an idea of the influence and the power if you like of his lectures and his words at the height of these conferences outside conventions in the 50s they attracted somewhere in the region of 10 to 12,000 people who would come for the weekend to listen to all the words of the contactees now the FBI wasn't so concerned about communism with Van Tassel they didn't find any evidence of that but they were sort of concerned about the fact that he was um, sort of he, but basically what he did a lot of his lectures were based around religion and he took the view that things like the the Star of Bethlehem the uh, Noah's Ark things like this he he basically placed this into like an alien um, angle if you like kind of like the the ancient alien show um, he viewed the idea that things like the burning bush and angels coming down that it was actually distorted stories of ancient extraterrestrials visiting the earth and that was one of the areas that the FBI f had a deep interest in as well the fact that this man was talking about essentially rewriting religion which you know for some people I guess you know it would have um, created a lot of controversy so again you had this situation where the FBI were watching once more people who in essence were talking to a lot of people about UFOs but also having this other spin on it as well whether it's communism or whether it was let's throw religion out the window and reinterpret everything from the aliens perspective now that's a building that um, George Van Tassel built called the Integratron and um, it was designed supposedly to create a way to have never, ast never, uh, never ending lasting life or at least to slow down the aging process and um, but the big irony was that he actually died of old age before he could finish it so uh, <laughs> it didn't work out too well for, for Van Tassel um, but um, he, there's no doubt that he was a very skilled man and he has an intriguing background um, for example he used to work for Hughes Aircraft which was the Howard Hughes company uh, who was the, one of the early aviation um, geniuses but also um, you know a, a, like a very um, eccentric character as well now a lot of people don't know that um, Howard Hughes actually had a lot of ties to the CIA and he was also as I said big friends uh, with George Van Tassel 
And actually, Howard Hughes often flew in to Giant Rock and spent weekends with the Van Tassel family. And apparently, that um, Hughes was so addicted to uh, Mrs. Van Tassel's cherry pies that he would come into he would come into town like once a month and just take back with him like two or three huge cherry pies and uh, which has nothing to do with UFOs you know but it's um, but it is kind of an unusual little story and um, so Van Tassel was someone who um, was also the subject of an FBI file the FBI's file on, on George Van Tassel runs to just over 300 pages. It's like that. And the reason why part of the file is so, or the, why the file's so thick, is because the FBI actually obtained copies of all his newsletters that he put out and, um, and went through them literally from front to back. To, and you know they would circle bits where he was talking about politics and religion. So again, it was a case of you know the government taking this interest in some an aspect of ufology that a lot of us wouldn't think about. You know how it impacts on on daily life and things like that. Now, another organisation, the Aetherius Society, uh, which was created in the UK, but its headquarters. Um, is in California and um, that was created by a guy named George King. Now I don't know why there's George Adamski, George Van Tassel and George King but <laughs> maybe, I don't know, maybe the aliens like George's, I don't know but, um, but it is just a coincidence I'm sure. But um, the Aetherius Society um, was very much in the vein of George Van Tassel and George Adamski. Now, the Aetherius Society, when it was set up in London, they did something which caught the attention of the British government. And what that was, was that... Um, oh, I'll put it on the floor. Um, the, what, it, what happened was that the Aetherius Society essentially allied itself with the Communist Party in the UK, and they were very big, vigorous, champions of getting rid of atomic weapons and one particular branch of the British police force called special branch which gets involved in terrorism and espionage that kind of thing they opened a file on the Aetherius Society and this is one of the uh, pages from the collection of documents from the British police force uh, from special branch which talks about the Aetherius Society and if you're near the front, you'll see it says Metropolitan Telegram, Police Telegram. And that was a Scotland Yard document. Um, the, the Aetherius Society file is probably about that thick, maybe 30 or 40 pages. And, um, and it says, an article in Empire News 26557 suggests that the Aetherius Society, um, of which George King, spiritualist medium, is a founder and organiser, may be serving as a channel for Russian propaganda. So, you know, whether there's anything to that or not, that's what the British police force were looking at. And of course, you know, it's like there's nothing new under the sun. You know, today we're talking about Russian propaganda and infiltration. And that's exactly what Special Branch thought with the Aetheria Society and George King. They felt that his interest in UFOs was actually sort of um, overtaken by his demands that, or his orders to uh, his, his followers that, you know, we need to try and find ways to convince the people of the UK that we need to get rid of our nuclear weapons. And again, the, um, the government in the UK opened this file on the Aetherius Society, not so much for the UFO angle, but for, because again, like George Adamski, George King was saying that the aliens were communists and that in essence we need to um, get rid of our nuclear weapons and live according to their views. Now, all of that kind of brings us to the issue of alien abductions, the abductees, rather than the contactees. So, in other words, we know, the reason why I mention all that with all the contactees is because with the Freedom of Information files, it does prove to us that government agencies really do watch people in the UFO subject. but. 
Who was that? <laughs> <laughs> um, it really does prove and demonstrate to us that government agencies do and have and continue to monitor people in the UFO subject but ufology very often is too often and too quick to say oh you know you're being watched because you're getting too close to the truth of Roswell or this but it may be because other things are going on in that researcher's life um, for example uh, back in England I know a couple of UFO researchers who had files opened on them but it wasn't because of the UFO angle, it was because they were working for animal rights organisations and that kind of thing. And they were seen as like troublemakers that, and things like that. So I always say, you know, if, uh, you may be being watched legitimately for the UFO angle, but is there anything else going on in, in your life as well at the same time? That somebody within government, and particularly today, you know, with all the uncertain, uncertainty in the world, is it possible that there's something else going on? We know that, quote, other things were going on with George Adamski, Van Tassel, and George King, um, and it all revolved around politics rather than aliens. So that's an important thing to remember. Now, when it comes to the alien abduction phenomenon, um, that is the arguably the most famous, two famous um, abductees of all time. That's Betty and Barney Hill, and that's their little dog Delcy in the middle, who for some reason appears in almost every photograph <laughs> that, the, that the Hills are taken in, so that they love the dog. Um, and in September 1961, the Hills um, took a vacation to Canada and on sep the night of September the 19th, on the way home, um, they saw this strange light in the sky. Didn't know what it was, it seemed almost to be shadowing them or following them. And they did feel quite sort of concerned by it. And as the evening went on, they got more and more kind of worried and concerned and stressed. And when they got home, they realised that there was a substantial amount of time missing. and. As the, as the days and weeks progressed, they started to have weird dreams and nightmares of being taken on board this craft and subjected to medical experiments and um, essentially being treated like a lab rat, that kind of situation. And so you had this situation where the, the phenomenon didn't really sort of explode immediately, but people began to realise in ufology that this was a new angle to something within the subject. It was, it was a, I won't say these, the contactees were gone, because they weren't. There still are a lot of contactees around today that have groups and organisations, and they really do still follow this path even today in the 21st century. But what we had was um, a sort of a, st a subtle and slow start where the contactee movement was sort of elbowed out, elbowed out of the picture and in its place became the abduction phenomenon. And certainly the, the, uh, the Hill story, which was uh, written as a, as a book by John Fuller called The Interrupted Journey, that's a really good book because, and it's one that I always recommend people to read, because it really, although it wasn't the first abduction story, um, it certainly was one which opened people's eyes and it was, you know, extremely controversial. For the most part, if you, you know, if you dismiss the contactee cases, from the 40s, 50s and 60s really, UFO researchers were investigating UFO sightings. They weren't really, up until that point, actually investigating people who had been taken on board craft, unless they were, you know, talking about the contactees. But a lot of the, the UFO people at the time really didn't believe the stories of the contactees. So, um, you know, that, that demonstrates that most of the research was carried out on cases of things in the sky and, and not so much the people. But that definitely changed when things began to alter and you had the, uh, the case of the hills. Now, in the sort of post-hill um, era, cases certainly started to uh, expand and grow 
but not to a significant degree. It was really in the 70s onwards that the abduction phenomenon really became part of ufology, but not just that, but part of popular culture and also of the media as well, and the regular media. And um, you had researchers and writers like Bud Hopkins, <coughs> excuse me, who, um, who got further and further into the subject with his book Missing Time, to the point where I would say by the 1980s certainly, which was, I would say that was like the defining era or the defining decade within the abduction phenomenon when things really did kind of take off hugely. Now, again, just to show that there are files on the abductees, that's um, a sh uh, short portion of one of the Air Force files on the Betty and Barney Hill case. Um, there's about 15 pages in the public domain now on the Hills case, and, um, and it's sort of a regular Air Force intelligence file, um, one of which was opened as part of the um, US Air Force's Project Blue Book, which was the, um, the third UFO investigative program that the Air Force had. Prior to that in 47, they had Project Sign, then Project Grudge, and then Project Blue Book, which was closed down, closed down in 1969. But there have been rumours of sort of more covert, hidden programmes haven't gone on since 69. But, that's, as I said, that's one of the pa few pages that have been put in the pub uh, public domain as it relates to the, uh, the Hills case. So, now in their case, you know, there was no political angle at all. That really was a genuine interest in the abduction phenomenon and, and chronicling it and, and saving the information for whoever else wanted to read it within the military. <coughs> now, the more and more that we sort of get into this issue of alien abductions, the more and more we find odd cases of uh, what sounds like surveillance and I always sort of try and you know get this across in a in a down-to-earth fashion because you know when you start talking about oh the government's watching me you know and the strange clicks on the phone that kind of thing the mail's being tampered um, you know it sounds to people outside of the subject that you've sort of lost the plot and you know you're sort of peering through the curtains and some sort of, you know, what are you, conspiracy nuts, you know, that kind of thing. But the fact is that we do get a lot of really weird things go on in the abduction phenomenon, which do kind of suggest that in the same way that the FBI was watching the contactees in the 50s, that somebody decided to do likewise in the 60s and the 70s and onwards with the abductees, but with the abductees, what was absent was the political angle for the most part. Uh, now some of, the, some of the abductees did sort of go down that path, but for the most part they didn't. Um, one of the things that pops up in a lot of these cases are stories of what are so-called black helicopters. Um, and a lot of UFO researchers um, and abductees have claimed that at the height of their research when they're looking into really intriguing important cases they've had black helicopters fly over their homes and hover at sort of really precarious low levels and um, and essentially to sort of I guess intimidate people now in these cases you know who exactly is flying these helicopters um, is the big question and why are they flying them and who, in essence, you know, where are they flying from? Where's the funding coming from? You know, is this some sort of regular group within the government? Or is it sort of, um, you know, a private corporation that gets funding from the government? We really don't know, but um, I actually took that picture over my old home a couple of, about 10 years ago. And uh, when I had a spate of helicopters coming over the house like that, um, I mean, literally, like, really low. That's, um, I took this from sort of uh, just outside the backyard, or in the backyard, I should say, and that's the trees. And, um, and the reason why I was able to get, you know, pretty good pictures, because they were f flying really low. And, um, and that went on for quite a long time. And um, one of the people, I'm sure he won't mind, in the audience right now, uh, Ed Conroy, Ed, uh, Ed wrote a really good book 
called Report on Communion, which is all about um, Whitley Strieber's book, Communion, and which was probably the biggest selling abduction book ever. And, um, and I re really enjoyed um, Communion because Whitley Strebe was talking about concepts and ideas that went far beyond just um, oh the aliens are taking us for our DNA that kind of thing and they're a dying race and they, they're taking our blood and DNA etc etc and um, but Whitley went down some very controversial aspects where he brought into things like synchronicity and life after death and fate and karma and things like this all kind of playing a role and I know from that time that there were people in ufology who they're like well this isn't what we want we want to hear about nuts and bolts UFOs and aliens etc etc but Whitley to his credit stood by what he said and and told his story now Ed, one year later, I think it was, or two years later, had his book public, published, Report on Communion, which Ed, as a, as a journalist, um, did sort of his own personal detached investigation of Whitley's claims. And, um, and that's a really good book, which to me, it's like essential reading alongside Communion itself, because you get the words from Whitley himself, but you also get the... Um, the view of a, of a non-biased uh, journalist, you know, looking into the thing as well. And then, lo and behold, um, Ed started to get weird experiences with, um, with helicopters and weird things with his answer phone, um, to the point where, you know, it became, where ironically, Ed was writing a book, detached book, on Whitley's claims, and then Ed arguably becomes part of the story as well you know you, you get sucked into it as well so that's you know that's a strange aspect to it but um, the, the black helicopter thing is one of the more weirder angles and and there have also been some really weird cases where some researchers have have actually wondered are they really helicopters are they something that is like a like a camouflage kind of thing like a stealth kind of technology um, which really takes things down an odd path. Now, we come to The Men in Black. That's one of my uh, books on The Men in Black and, um, and how they sort of impact on the abduction phenomenon as well. Now, a lot of people, you know, if you mention The Men in Black, the first thing they think of is Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones, you know, because <laughs> Everybody around the world, you know, um, n knows the movies. You know, it doesn't matter what country you're in, you, people have probably seen those movies. Um, now, in the movies, the men in black are sort of portrayed as these secret agents of this secret agency. And they, in, in essence, you know, they go out and they silence people in the UFO field, witnesses, researchers, abductees, and tell them, you know, you won't talk about this. That is the, the imagery that uh, is presented in the movies. Now, a lot of people don't know that the Men in Black movies were inspired by real reports of so-called Men in Black. Um, interestingly enough, although the, the flying saucer phenomenon began in 47, it actually wasn't till around about 51 when the Men in Black mystery started to take off. And it all began with a guy named Albert Bender and Albert Bender lived in Bridgeport, Connecticut and he was a very strange, unusual, eccentric guy. Um, he lived in this um, creepy old house. If you've ever seen um, the, the movie Psycho, um, Norman Bates, who's sort of actually also his mother at the same time, and, um, and lives in this creepy old house on this sort of little hill. That's kind of the, the house that Albert Bender lived in and he actually rented the attic uh, of all rooms possible. And what he did, he changed the attic room into what he called his chamber of horrors. And he, he sort of put all these um, like uh, faces of skulls hanging from the ceiling and uh, pictures of werewolves and demons and dragons. and. Um, one of the, in his own book, 
flying saucers in the three men he said that one of the things that he liked to do is if a girlfriend came over on a Friday night or something he'd throw rubber spiders at them and uh, <laughs> and he probably didn't get many more dates after that you know but um, but that by in his own words you know he was a bit of an uh, unusual character but Albert Bender was also someone who um, had a deep interest not in UFOs not just in UFOs but also in the occult and the supernatural and he was heavily influenced by people like Aleister Crowley um, one of the earliest or most famous occultists and he Bender essentially created what he called this supernatural altar and he tried to sort of um, invoke if you like or uh, call through supernatural beings and it was if you believe his story it was kind of like what you ask for is what you're going to get and he talked about how one night he was in in his bedroom his attic room and he suddenly felt ill he felt sort of weak and tired and he didn't have any energy he started to get the shakes and he had to lay down on the bed and he said that as he did so the, w the room was filled with this odour of like um, brimstone or sulphur which is sort of like a classic thing that's tied to a lot of paranormal activity and he said these three men in black came into the room but not as you would imagine like in the movies he said they actually sort of materialized through the walls in sort of like a shadowy um, shape of like a silhouetted shadowy shape with these shining bright eyes and supposedly telepathically warned him to leave the UFO subject alone or else now for a while Bender said well you know I'm gonna keep doing this um, sort of to hell with them but the more that he tried to dig into this the worse and worse the in intimidation got the worse and worse his health got he started to develop an irrational belief that he got that he got cancer which he actually didn't and he only di he only died uh, two years ago at the age of 94 so um, you know he actually lived a long life um, but he, he developed this irrational fear of cancer um, that people were following him and they may well have been um, and eventually he could not take it anymore and he quit ufology and he only came back very briefly in 1962 to write this book flying saucers and the three men which is like a bizarre combination of I don't know the X-Files kind of meets Barbarella if any of you have ever seen that movie <laughs> which is like this it's like this hot this hot space girl who literally appears in his room you know and um, I think that was probably more out of Bender's subconscious than anything else but um, but yeah he was someone who basically told this w very very weird story but he was also the, got the guy who was responsible for beginning the men in black phenomenon so regardless of what you think of his story his claims his character um, he really was the guy who began um, he really was the guy who began this mystery of the or talking about the mystery of the men in black and then other people came forward with their own cases that UFO researchers witnesses who have got late night uh, knocks on the door and you know there's some creepy guys there and warning them not to talk about their UFO encounters now in most of the men in black reports the the MIB are actually not described like in the movies typically they're described as being sort of pale and they have these strange eyes and uh, they wear these old style fedora hats black suits and they're sometimes described as being very tall and extremely skinny almost looking kind of anorexic and they don't seem really human that's how they come across as, as controversial and as bizarre as it sounds so but what happened was that when the the movies were in production uh, well I should say before production the basically they were based on a comic book series from the 90s called um, Men in Black and so the movie versions were based more on the idea that the MIB were from the government rather than the the story told within ufology itself that they were something much much weirder and I've written quite a few books on the Men in Black mystery altogether and I get a lot of feedback and most of the people do describe them 
you know, like that. They look sort of anemic and pale. And they, as I said, they don't come across as looking entirely, looking human. entirely and people human. Talk and people talk about, like with Albert Bender, that in their presence they started to feel ill and sick and almost like a supernatural infection somehow. And so that really started the, this other aspect of surveillance. Now, some people will tell you that the men in black are from the government. I don't think they are. I don't know what they are, but I don't think they've anything to do with the Pentagon or the Department of Defense, <coughs> anything like that. Um, but there are so many cases which suggest that there's a really weird situation going on. You've got the abductees and the witnesses who have been watched by the government, but they're also being watched by this other group, the men in black, who we don't know what on earth they are. Um, so you have potentially two groups watching the abductees themselves. Now, we also have the stories of the women in black, and, um, and uh, that's actually a piece of artwork um, done uh, by a friend of mine a couple of years ago for one of the books. Now, although, you know, the men in, everybody knows the term men in black or man in black, um, and even for people who aren't really necessarily interested in the UFO subject, you know, if you ask them, who are the men in black? Oh, that's those UFO guys. Everybody knows that. Um, lesser known, though, are the women in black. Now, this is how many of the, of the women in black are described, because it isn't just men in black who turn up at people's doorsteps and threaten them and frighten them. You can see here they've got like the solid black eyes. Their eyes don't look entirely normal or human. And a lot of the witnesses describe the hair in like a bang style as actually looking like a wig. Um, now, if you think about it, if you were to remove the wig and let's say there's no hair under there and the black eyes and that sort of pointed chin that actually look would look not unlike the picture of the alien on Whitley Strieber's communion you know as if we're talking about um, a heavily camouflaged creature or entity that isn't fully human and actually um, in, uh, I think it was in his second book, uh, Transformation, that Whitley talks about how um, a guy named Bruce Lee, not, not the Bruce Lee, but um, who worked for a publisher, who had a very strange experience with a man and a woman um, who, and bear in mind that Bruce Lee worked on communion, and he had a very strange experience with a, with a man and a woman who looked sort of heavily camouflaged and didn't want their real appearance to be known. So that's, you know, that's the, the imagery of the, the women in black and, um, and like the men in black, they try and get the, find a way into the home um, and threaten people, sometimes in a subtle way, sometimes in a less subtle way. Um, so it's not just, you know, it's not just one phenomenon, it's two. That's uh, another piece of artwork, again, you know, sort of displaying how they look and uh, a UFO hovering overhead. Now, that's a friend of mine and, and Miles, Greg Bishop. Now, Greg is someone who's got a lot of interest in the UFO subject and a lot of alternative views on, on the whole phenomenon. And in the 1990s, Greg had a lot of really weird stuff happen to him. Um, one of the things, he was friends with a woman named Dr. Carla Turner. And Carla Turner was abductee who, unfortunately, she died young from cancer. Um, but Greg and Carla um, set up a friendship between each other, just getting to know each other at conferences and things like that. And this was sort of um, 93, 94. We're talking about obviously, you know, before the internet and email. So they would, they would send letters to each other. You know, uh, I guess people still do that occasionally, but, um, but um, they would send letters to each other. And when the letter from Greg to Carla and to Carla to Greg, etc., arrived, it would be opened and, and taped back down again with scotch tape. But it was done in such a way that it was, the letters were torn open and the tape was put on um, to, to close the envelopes again. But it was done in such a way that both Carla and Greg 
couldn't fail to see that someone had opened the mail and resealed it. And, you know, it seemed as if somebody was sending a message, they actually wanted them to know that they were being watched. Now, on top of that, Greg started to get weird phone calls in the middle of the night, strange static on the line, um, just odd voices on the line, which is something that um, often pops up in Men in Black stories. And one of the weirdest of all was that Greg was at home one day and he just happened to look out the window and a car pulled up, a guy got out and stood in front of his window and took a picture and jumped back in the car and drove off. And Greg really did begin to think that someone was, you know, this was intimidation. It was like a psychological um, approach, you know, just to trying to dismantle, if you like, um, Greg's sanity. That's how it came across. And in the, in the end, he actually did walk away from the UFO subject for a few years and then brought, came back into it. But uh, for a while, he did sort of take a detached approach. And, um, and just as, a, as a, an aside, that particular cemetery and that particular grave there, uh, I took that picture of Greg about, uh, probably about seven or eight years ago now, <laughs> And it's the grave of a man named Paul Benowitz. And Paul Benowitz was someone who um, also found himself on the, um, the bad hand, if you like, of um, government surveillance when he started looking into UFO activity in New Mexico around Kirtland Air Force Base and also um, abductions and cattle mutilations and things like that. And, uh, and again, some of the files on Benowitz, not many, but a few, have been placed into the public domain. But, um, but Greg wrote a really good book on, um, on Paul Benowitz called uh, Project Beta. Um, and that sort of tells the story of how Paul Benowitz found himself um, a sort of at the mercy of um, men in black types, almost. Now, you might wonder what on earth does the story of Mothman have to do with alien abductions? Well, the answer's quite a lot. Again, just so you know, that's me, that's Mothman. And, uh, <laughs> Um, for, for people who don't know, um, the story of the Mothman goes back to 1966 and, and the town of Point Pleasant, West Virginia. And in late 66, a number of people in a near, nearby town called Clendenin uh, reported seeing this strange humanoid figure, like that with bright red eyes and huge wings, flying through the sky. And sightings then began to focus on the town of Point Pleasant and what happened from there was that over the course of the next year you had numerous UFO sightings, men in black reports and this particular case the the Mothman sightings and um, the only way you could kind of describe it is um, like as a flying humanoid type creature which of course there should not be anything like that living anywhere. Now and again, just as a little aside, a friend of mine, um, <coughs> excuse me, friend of mine, Ken Gerhard, uh, Ken wrote a book called Encounters with Flying Humanoids, and um, he, he covers Mothman extensively in that. So that, that book will give you a good um, sort of coverage of the story. And the reason I mention that is because Ken only lives just down in San Antonio. And um, so if you want to learn more about the Mothman, his book is, is a really good sort of primer to the story. But people were talking about seeing this strange creature, the Mothman, all around town and abductees, contactees, UFO witnesses were being visited by the men in black and by the women in black. In some of the, the women in black cases, they would knock on um, UFO witnesses' doors and claim to be taking, that we're taking a census, can we come in? Um, or, you know, we, we're doing a survey for the government, can we come in? That sort of thing. And um, what's interesting is, you know, they always, always try and find a way to have the, the person, the homeowner, whoever's at home, to invite them in. And John Keel, who wrote a book on all this called The Mothman Prophecies, Keel noted that, you know, this angle of where they always needed to be invited in was kind of like the parallels with the old vampire legends where, um, you know, in, in the stories, in the folklore, the, you know, the vampires had to be invited into the home. 
and that's the same with the men in black and the women in black they don't force their way in they, they try and find a way to be invited into the home so that's sort of like a little weird creepy aside but the the sightings of the mothman and the men in black around town went on for just over a year and just to give you an idea this was 66 67 and just to give you an idea of how things are today the town has sort of really embraced the <coughs> phenomenon of mothman to the point where they have this year, uh, yearly festival called the mothman festival which just like george van tassel's um outdoor events in um in, in California, the ones in, in Point Pleasant, which are put on every year, they attract audiences anywhere from about 8,000 to 10, 11,000 every year. And um, they, they basically sort of, um, it, it's like a celebration of this monster that sort of created terror and, and fear all around Point Pleasant from 66 to 67. Now, Today, um, the situation is very different. Back then, it was sort of bleak and dark and terrifying for the people of the town. But today, as I said, it's more of like, um, like a celebration. It's like an outdoors. Imagine something like a, a monster-driven um, county fair, that kind of thing. And, um, you know, there are, there are people sort of selling, um, uh, you know, Mothman fridge magnets, T-shirts, caps. Um, you know food you can even buy um mothman beer which i've tried and it tastes just like normal beer <laughs> um but you know so they've really embraced the, the mothman phenomenon as something to you know to, to be pleased about i guess but it, uh, the actual situation ended in tragedy that's another piece of artwork around town where you've got the the mothman carrying the american flag which is sort of a strange picture but <laughs> that's a that's a huge piece of artwork it's about that's probably about 30 feet high by about 40 feet wide something like that wow. yeah. you put that on a main street yeah now that's actually, that's one of the many bridges in point pleasant um point pleasant is actually only a small town um but it, ha and it only has a small population, but it has a huge number of bridges. And the reason being is that Point Pleasant, the town, borders the Ohio River. So you've got Point Pleasant, you've got Point Pleasant there, you've got the Ohio River, then you've got Ohio. And what happened in mid-December uh, 1967, at the height of the Mothman sightings, was that one of those bridges, not that one, that's, that's a new picture I took a year or two ago, but one of the bridges called the Silver Bridge collapsed into the Ohio River and 46 people drowned uh, because they, the cars just went straight into the river and they, you know, they were drowned. And so you have this situation where a, mo a lot of people around town came to believe or suspect that the presence of the Mothman was somehow related and linked to the death of all these various people whose lives had come to an end when the bridge collapsed into the river. And, and at the time, it was the worst bridge disaster in terms of deaths in the history of the United States. And um, the cause of it, um, it was put down to one of the um, one of the bolts in the in the bridge having done this but people claim to have seen the mothman sort of hovering and looming around the bridge in the days before the bridge collapsed so although today it is sort of seen as like um, a more friendly type of outdoor event when you read the actual story and the collapse of the bridge and all the deaths you know it does sort of place it in a in a much darker kind of situation um, that picture is uh, taken of me in one of what are known in Point Pleasant as a series of igloos. What they basically are is in the Second World War, um, the military, the US military created um, a plant for, for making TNT, dynamite, which would be shipped out to Europe to fight the Germans. And they created these huge igloo type buildings where all the TNT could be safely stored. Now after the Second World War, and everything was closed down and these old buildings these sort of um, igloo type buildings were just left there and that was where 
where these buildings were, which are now sort of just overrun by trees and vines and bushes, uh, and it, it does have sort of like an apocalyptic aspect to it. Um, but if you go there now, uh, as I said, it's just all overgrown. But that particular area that, that's known as the TNT plant, that's where most of the Mothman sightings occurred um, in 1967. Now, if we bring this up to the modern day, um, the story kind of gets weirder. In 2017, there were a lot of reports of people seeing creatures like the Mothman, um, not in Point Pleasant, West Virginia, but in and around the city of Chicago. And if you Google Mothman plus um, Chicago plus 2017, you'll see how there are literally dozens and dozens of accounts of people seeing these sort of large black winged humanoid type feature creatures excuse me sort of appearing over buildings and on rooftops and sort of silently gliding through the sky and at the same time that this was going on there was also significant UFO sightings but there was something else as well that a number of abductees in and around the Chicago area started to have apocalyptic dreams and nightmares of, of nuclear war and things like this. And the, the story got so big um, <coughs> excuse me, that a guy named Lon Strickler wrote an entire book all about the 2017 wave in, uh, in, in Chicago. Now, I wrote a couple of articles about this whole scenario and got a lot of feedback from people who'd read the articles and people who'd seen these creatures in and around um, Chicago and also the people who'd, who'd had these sort of apocalyptic dreams and they were all talking about all of this in, in kind of one situation where you had abductees um, and you had witnesses to the Mothman and both groups were also having these dreams, these nightmares of like a worldwide destruction of you know of civilization and um, and it, what's particularly disturbing is that some of the witnesses were talking about how in their dreams that the United States had been attacked but we hadn't been able to fight back and they were trying to figure out well how could that be and some of the abductees looking into it and researching it came to believe in their in their dreams in their nightmares that what had happened that prior to the attack granted it was just, they were just dreams but prior to the attack they saw how that the Russians had launched what's called an EMP attack. EMP stands for electromagnetic pulse weapon, which basically, let's say, God forbid it happened, and you know we don't we don't ever want anything like this to happen. But if an EMP weapon was exploded over Austin, what it would basically do would wipe out just about every electromagnetic device. There would be no electric. There would be no internet. There'd be no cell phones. Your car wouldn't go. You, for, for, Want of a better term, everything would just be blown out completely. And um, you know, it's it's one of these situations where the EMP, the potential for an EMP attack, is actually one of the most dangerous that exists to this day. And in their dreams and nightmares, some of the people were talking about this. But what's more intriguing is that when I started to get feedback from readers and so on. Uh, one of the people said to me, have you read Whitley Strieber's book, War Day? And I said, um, I'm not sure. <laughs> and, uh, so I read it, and what's particularly intriguing, bear in mind Whitley's book was written back in 1984. This was three years before Communion, three years before he was talking about a, um, aliens and alien reductions. But in uh, War Day, which is a novel, uh, in which Whitley's family actually are part of the story. It's, it's a fictional novel, but it's, he's in the story. Um, and it is a really terrifying novel of what a real nuclear war could be like. But what's interesting, but also unsettling, is that in War Day, um, Whitley talks about or creates this, this figure that is seen in various places where nuclear war has, 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 has affected the cities or destroyed them and it's described as being like a, a Mothman type creature. So we've got this situation where Whitley in 84 
writes War Day about a nuclear attack on the US and in the story people are seeing this sort of gargoyle type glowing eyed Mothman type figure and then in 2017 we've got abductees which Whitley was also talking about Mothman type creatures in Chicago and in relation to Mothman sightings in Chicago and on top of that this was the same time frame when people were getting sort of antsy and concerned you know saying on the news that North Korea might be a, have a potential to develop an atomic weapon that could reach either Seattle or Chicago and that Chicago came up several times in that situation so this was sort of like a really odd afterward almost if you like in relation to the Mothman phenomenon of these abductees um, all having these strange dreams, apocalyptic dreams of nuclear war in the same time frame that other people were seeing the Mothman and um, and it's a very strange story as I said if you want to read the full story Lon Strickler's book um, on Mothman is, is, a, is a very intriguing book because it gets into all these different aspects of you know like a looming disaster which fortunately did not happen obviously because we would know um, but again it, it demonstrates some of the weirder aspects of the abduction phenomenon that goes far beyond like the equivalent of somebody else's a version of NASA visiting us you know there's a lot of a lot of prophetic stuff and and, and dreams and nightmares and, and things that you would not necessarily think at first glance at least would be directly connected to UFOs now I mentioned um, <coughs> excuse me I mentioned earlier the whole angle of um, surveillance and things like this and being watched and uh, people often ask me you know have you ever had any experiences along these lines um, well I actually have a few not many and, and all of them were kind of weird now we mentioned the uh, or discussed the whole black helicopter phenomenon earlier now that picture um, I actually took that picture in March of this year um, on the steps of the apartments where I live in Arlington Texas um, the one where I live it's like a two-story apartment block and I was standing outside and the, well I went outside I should say because I could hear this helicopter you know the, the typical boop, 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 boop that a helicopter makes but it was so loud you know you could almost feel it so I went outside and that's actually one of the pictures now let's uh, show you I took four or five altogether that's that's a f more close-up one and there was two of them all together now that was take it was a it was a cloudy day but it was about four o'clock something like that and although oops, excuse me and even though it was about four o'clock you know it was still bright enough to take those pictures and there's one thing that those helicopters lack do you know what it is uh -uh, not the rotor no markings markings yeah yeah, there's, both helicopters had no markings on them at all, which is actually illegal to have a helicopter that doesn't have any markings. Now that one, that one's probably better. Um, that one's sort of more in silhouette, but there's not a single um, marking or ID on that particular helicopter at all. And when I say they were flying around my apartment, I do mean literally they were flying around my apartment for about 20 minutes circling now you know you could make the case that perhaps it was the police perhaps there was like a car accident and they were they were hovering around you know five streets away there'd been a bad accident someone was killed that's not impossible and that could have been the case and maybe because I have an interest in all this I put two and two together and made five that's not impossible but you cannot get away from the fact that the, the helicopters were completely black. There were no markings of any kind whatsoever. And so that, that's one example. Um, now, when I was at the height of doing one of my books on the men in black, uh, I started to get like a lot of weird stuff happen in relation to that. And, uh, and as odd as it sounds, a number of researchers who've looked into the men in black mystery when they get into it it's like the phenomenon kicks back 
at them and they start to experience weird stuff. Now, John Keel in his book, The Mothman Prophecies, he talks about how um, at the height of his Bigfoot, excuse me, of his um, Men in Black research, he would have situations where um, the phone would ring in the middle of the night and there would be strange static or these weird voices in languages that you couldn't even understand. Well, I had something like that happen over the course of about four nights. And of course, you know, it's like with anybody, if the phone goes in the middle of the night, you think it's bad news or something, so you go to it. And on two occasions I did that and heard like really weird static on the line. Now, the third time it happened, there was nothing on the line at all. But on my caller ID, it was actually my own phone, my landline number. And, um, and it was kind of, you know, like that old movie, you know, the, the callers inside the house, or you know, that old movie. And, um, and that, that's how it kind of came across. You know, I looked at it, and I just stared at it, and the incoming call was my landline, which I just picked up, which was, you know, really strange. And um, there have been a few things like that have happened over the years, and also to my agent, Lisa, Lisa Hagen, who handles my books. Um, Lisa's had a lot of weird stuff. Um, she's um, a publisher of paranormal books and UFO books. And she had a um, very similar situation to Greg Bishop, where um, a car pulled up outside her house, a guy jumped out, took a couple of pictures, jumped back in and drove off. So, you know, you can find a lot of stories like that within the UFO subject. Um, but to demonstrate that this isn't just sort of like a small cluster of people, um, through the Freedom of Information Act now, I've got probably, probably about 30 to 40 files on people who are now deceased, um, who were involved in ufology and who did have files open on them. Now, for people who don't know, the Freedom of Information Act, which you can use and which is a very good tool for getting government files, and the FBI is really good um, at opening you know, or, or making files um, available. Um, you know, I often hear people being critical of government and saying, you know, they won't release this, they won't release that. But the FBI actually, they're really good at um, being helpful and releasing these files. And um, as well as the three Georges, Adamski, Van Tassel, and George King, um, there's also files on several other early contactees, one named Truman Betheram, another one George Hunt Williamson, and also Orfeo Angelucci, and it, up into the more um, sort of just UFO based period. Um, people like Leonard Stringfield, who was an early UFO researcher, I managed to get his file. Now, you have there's, a, there's two ways to get people's files through the Freedom of Information Act. That's to get their permission to ask for the file, or if the person's dead. If the person's dead, anybody can request the file. If they're alive, then you have to get their permission and do it on their behalf. Um, now, sometimes, you know, files are opened for almost like comical reasons. For example, um, if, if you write to the FBI, you can actually request if there's a file on you. But of course, if, the F, if, you, know, if, you, if you send a, a request to the FBI, have you got a file on me? The first thing the FBI is going to think, why does this guy want to know if we've got a file on him? <laughs> so what they're going to do, they're going to open a file. So it's almost like, um, you know, it's like an inevitable situation. Um, but certainly with, um, certainly with a lot of people in ufology, back in the 50s and 60s, there was this ongoing surveillance of people. Now, of course, what this brings us to is the issue of what's really going on. Um, are we looking just at the government? Um, and is the government only concerned because of this political side of it all? Or do they think, you know, there's more to it? Um, and they're looking at it just from, from the abduction angle. Um, I was able once to speak to a guy, um, retired military guy, who did tell me that there, there, there was kind of like a small group within the government that was looking at the abduction phenomenon, not because they had proof that it was going on, but because it, it was potential 
you know, the potential was there for national security issues that they had to look into it anyway. And he said, you know, we look into a lot of weird things which don't go anywhere, and sometimes they do go somewhere. And he basically said that there was a group that looked into the abduction phenomenon mainly because people were talking about people being kidnapped and implanted and things like this and the government or a group a small group i should say felt we should look into it to see if there's anything to it or not and some people in the group thought it was nonsense and we shouldn't be wait wasting money on it other people thought well you know we've got plenty of budget we've got a big enough budget why don't we look into it so i think you know we can make a case going back to the 50s uh, for sure with the files we can say for sure that government agencies have taken an interest in people in ufology and still do to this day where it's all leading you know are there huge files on everybody in ufology maybe there are are there just files on people who they see as a pain in the neck and who have this political tie to them so far, you know, to be honest, we don't have enough data to say for sure what the, the reason is for today. Only that certainly there is some sort of surveillance. Um, the helicopters, the mail tampering. You know, I don't believe personally this is just down to paranoid people who, you know, peering through the curtains and seeing the men in black out the corner or whatever. I think something, there's something about the abduction phenomenon that I think has caused some degree of surveillance. And I think the one thing, more than any other, that the abduction phenomenon seems to have on a person is that it very often radically alters their lives. It changes their outlook on life, on the planet, on life after death, on all sorts of things. And I think sometimes, you know, when, when people's minds are changed on a collective huge level then that in itself probably you know would would be would be uh, something that governments would be interested in and even concerned about so i think you know the idea of an entire movement of people saying this and saying that um, that in itself i think could be reason enough for people in government to take note um, like Whitley's book Communion I mean that book really when I say it was like a phenomenon that's not an exaggeration it really was it took off hugely uh, it became a New York Times bestseller um, and the sales were gigantic and, and, and Whitley basically really got across very well how his life was changed and turned upside down but he came out of it as a as a better but I guess radically altered mind and when I say radically altered I mean in a positive way that he you know he saw life in a new way and maybe there are people who don't want us to think like that you know um, with uh, you know from somebody's perspective maybe we're perceived as you know just go to work go to bed go to work go to bed <laughs> rather than you know allow your mind to really open up to something that could actually have a, a positive effect on all of us and on the planet itself you know maybe that's part of the phenomenon is that it in its own odd way it pushes us to change things um, it doesn't you know they don't land on the White House lawn and they never have and they probably never will but kind of guiding us pushing us in a way that um, that may change things, I think that th I think that's what's going on, and whether it's going to be for good for bad, I don't know. But what I do think is I can well understand how people who prefer that we just, as I said, you know, birth, school, work, death, that kind of thing, you know, um, that's all there is. Well, maybe it's not all there is. Maybe we should be looking at things on a on a larger scale and I think the the abduction phenomenon the abductees are a perfect example of how <coughs> life can be changed in an extremely positive new and alternative way and I think you know that's that could be the whole reason um, 
for watching us or watching the abductees that it demonstrates something's going on that there are people that don't want it to go on so, so um, we've got um, let me see we've got about 30 minutes so if we've got any questions uh, I'll do my best oh thank you thank you Yeah, you're ready. Okay. Well, um, what language did the contactees, abductees, use to communicate with aliens? Well, according to the contactees, the, the contact was literally like verbally, you know, face to face and, and speaking English. Um, so that, that's sort of pretty, you know, just face to face, down to earth. Now, with the abductees, um, there's very rarely, if ever, I'd say rarely rather than ever. It's usually sort of like mind to mind, but very often it's sort of imagery, um, not always words, you know. Um, like I said, like apoc apocalyptic dreams, that sort of thing. Um, or imageries of um, like, you know, the deforestation and um, global warming and things like that. So it's often imagery but very graphic imagery rather than, than words when it comes to the abductees. Um, the second one, did you try to magnify the helicopter photo? Um, well, I've magnified it in the sense that I've blown it up several times before it starts to, you know, the pixels start to degrade. But um, on all the five pictures that I've got all together, um, there's not a single um, marking on any of either of the helicopters no matter what angle they're taken from you know because I've got some of the pictures where it's like angled like that and one where it's sort of going down a bit and one when it's turning and there's nothing it's just solid just complete black so um, I, I, I have sort of blown it up but it's not really sort of opening it up to anything more because it's just black you know um, what document what documentation have you uncovered concerning Nazi UFO flying saucer development and the Vril Society and Jack Parsons well um, well over the years there have been a lot of rumors that in the closing sta um, stages of the Second World War there have been a lot of rumors that the Nazis were trying to develop circular type aircraft um, like a and what have become known as Nazi flying saucers. Um, there's a lot of accounts, a lot of stories, and the Germans were actually developing a lot of weird aircraft in the final stages of the war. But so far, you know, th there's no smoking gun. You know, there's no actual photographs or remains or wreckage um, having been found, you know, when the Germans were, were defeated. So, you know, um, it's interesting because they were developing a lot of strange aircraft but so far as I said we, we've not really reached that another point. Now as far as Jack Parsons is concerned, um, Jack Parsons was this rocket scientist, brilliant rocket scientist from the 30s who blew himself, by mis blew himself up by mistake in 1952 but he was a really advanced rocket scientist um, but he was also someone who was heavily involved in the occult and he ran the Pasadena, California office of um, Alistair Crowley's organization and um, to give you an idea of the kind of thing that he got involved in, he actually was given a top secret clearance by the Army, Navy and Air, Navy and Air Force in the Second World War to um, 
to basically develop rocketry for, to, to beat the Germans. And fortunately, fortunately you know, the, the war came to an end and we won without the sort of massive use of rockets. Um, but before each um, rocket test, he would um, invoke the god Pan to, uh, to, to try and like, allow for a, a successful flight. And, you know, you can probably imagine a lot of the sort of generals and colonels standing around thinking, who on earth is this guy we've got, you know, working on our rocket program with a top secret clearance, you know, and he's, he's calling up on ancient gods for, for um, successful missions. But they, I guess they kind of, you know, put a, you know, like a blind eye kind of situation where they, they were like, well, if he can get the job done, it doesn't really matter what he does in his free time, you know. Um, but, he died, as I say, he died in 1952, he blew himself up in his lab and some people have wondered if the sort of the whole negative energy and the Hollister Crowley thing may have had impacted on, on that kind of situation, that like a dark cloud came over his home and not literally, but you know what I mean, and, um, and it caused, you know, this sort of tragic, violent death you know, that, that he had, so... Um, but, it, but he was a clever guy and, um, you know, he's sort of like a, almost like the rock star of his day, that sort of thing, so. Got some more? Okay. Okay, was George Van Tassel associated with Jack Parsons? Um, I, I've not seen anything directly that, that connects him, no. Um, but Van Tassel, as I said, was was linked to a lot of people. As I said, like um, Howard Hughes, and um, he worked for Hughes Aircraft, and, and and he worked at a lot of other aircraft companies as well. But I haven't personally come up, um, you know, with anything. And also, it's as Albert Bender, but um, Bender may well possibly have met by um, uh, Van Tassel. I mean, it's not impossible because. Uh, Bender did actually sort of um, put out a, a, a magazine called the International, excuse me, called uh, Flying, what was it called? Saucer Review, I think Saucer Review or Saucer News. He put out this magazine and he did get a lot of correspondence from people in ufology, so it's not impossible that, that Bender and Tassel could have uh, potentially crossed paths. Why do, why do you suppose the military and government come and tell people that witness UFOs are aliens, that they're never to speak of it again? Um, well, I think part of it could be, I mean, I'm, I'm guessing here, but I think one scenario, okay. when we think of, of government investigating UFOs, we assume that the government has the answers. But what if the government actually doesn't have any better clue than we do. I think that could actually be the case, that they've got a lot of data, a lot of information, but as far as answers are concerned, they may be as, as stuck for the answers as we are. So I think part of the reason why government agencies may not want us to talk about this or to share data, etc., is because they don't know what's going on. And, you know, government agencies, military agencies, would look quite vulnerable if they admitted, you know, well, we really don't know what's happening. Yeah, we've got, we've got this, we've got all this data, we've got all this information, but we know more wise than you are. And I think, I think possibly they don't want people to speak about these events for fear that maybe that would get out, that, that, that everybody's in the dark, that nobody knows. Okay. Can you talk about the, on the connection between the UFO phenomenon and near-death experiences? Um, there's actually quite a few cases like that where people have been taken on board a UFO and abduction scenario and they've sort of seen their body laying on a table but they've been looking down on it, kind of like a near-death experience that people report in, in hospitals, that kind of thing. Um, but there's, there's some lesser known, interesting ones. Uh, there was a case um, in 1973 um, in um, Ohio, 
and um, it's been no become known as the Coin case. And it was a helicopter-based case. Um, the captain, Captain Coin, and his crew were flying into an airport near Ohio, um, in Ohio, and they saw this strange glow, uh, green glowing object in the sky and couldn't see what it was we got closer and closer and it was obviously some sort of ufo now in the aftermath of this encounter um, the captain coins crew were contacted by somebody from the department of defense and the, the crew have actually gone on the record um, in relation to this and they said that they were phone telephoned by the dod or representatives of the dod and asked if have you had any weird dreams as if you, your soul was separated from your body um, or you've had like a near-death experience and this suggests that somebody in the government back in 73 when this happened knew already that there was some sort of connection between the UFO angle and the soul and, and near-death experiences I don't know where they got the information from how they got it what it means but somebody in government was already digging into that uh, to the extent where Captain Coyne's crew were all interviewed about this and one of the guys said well how did you know that or words to that effect and he said yeah I did he said I woke up at like three in the morning and I was looking down on myself and, and he thought he was dead and um, so again you know there are these snippets that lead us to believe that somebody even maybe back then was was um, monitoring the um, the abductees but the problem is unlike the FBI files on the contactees we we're still lacking a lot of the files when it comes to the abductees what is your opinion best guess of what these aliens are doing what is their intention for us well that's that's a good question but I mean I guess most people want it to be benevolent and friendly and helpful but I mean from the from the abduction perspective there are a lot of people who've had sort of a positive outcome from it where they have the abduction experience and there are people who've sort of almost literally overnight you know they've changed their entire lifestyle they've gone vegetarian they take part in um, you know in, in, in debates public debates and their life really alters from what they see as like a, a, a positive perspective but in saying that there are also you know the downsides I mean the average abduction experience for a lot of people is, can be quite traumatic you know sort of treated like as I mentioned earlier like a, a lab rat and taken in the middle of the night and subjected to experimentation and told oh it's all don't worry about it it's all for your own good well you know if that was me I'm not sure I would believe that it was actually for my own good now I get it that a lot of people have these experiences and they perceive it as being a genuinely uh, uplifting experience but on the other hand you know maybe maybe it's not I mean to use like a bleak analogy you know the farmer who looks after the cows well the cows think the farm is the greatest thing under the sun why because he builds his building for them every night and they're warm and he feeds them every day so how could he be anything bad you know but what happens eventually well the the, the cow gets taken off you know to the to where it goes so um, you know so you, you can if you want to look at it black and white you can sort of look at it from the perspective of um, of just seeing one side of the coin you know you're not seeing the full picture and there's also the phenomenon of what's known as Stockholm syndrome and Stockholm syndrome is a very weird syndrome it's like where let's say somebody you get kidnapped and you held with these kidnappers for like six months in a lot of cases the the person who's kidnapped kind of gravitates and moves towards their kidnappers and even develops like an affinity and a friendship with them and and it's a really strange psychological syndrome if you look up Stockholm syndrome you'll see how it how it works and how people feel that oh well they're not so bad after all that kind of thing and and they start to f develop feelings even for them and it's a very odd psychological um, situation so maybe that could kind of tie in as well uh, with the recent release of an F-18 aircraft video of a UFO that was not 
due to a, f a f freedom of information request. Do you think the government is shifting its approach to a proactive stance? Um, well, I mean, it's interesting that like, towards the end of the last year, there was this revelation that the, the government did have an ongoing UFO program after all. Um, now, that group itself was a fairly kind of low-level group, I think. It wasn't um, like a gigantic program. It was more like a, a think tank type group. But I th for me, the most important thing about this revelation last year that it demonstrates that there are people in governments and the military and the intelligence community who are still investigating the UFO phenomenon. And if there's one group, there could be other groups, you know. I mean, if you've got one group looking at to the UFO angle, um, then that actually makes it far more plausible that another group could be looking at the um, abductee angle. Somebody else could be looking at another angle of it all. So I think just the fact that there was this revelation is a good pointer that research is still going on and we may not see the full picture. <coughs> have, I, have you encountered abductees with stories and, and journeys to the inner earth um, or Antarctica? No, I actually haven't. Um, I mean, there's a lot of weird stories about the inner earth and, um, you know, caverns and caves and things like that, but I've not personally investigated that phenomenon at all. Um. I can't read the one word. Do you think there is an exo? What was the next word? An exo economic connection to Earth, meaning that financial or a social economic connection. Because if they're flying these UFOs, obviously somebody's manufacturing them and they're mm. they're made. So there is a socio economic pattern out there in space. Mm. Is there any connection to that in Earth is my question. I mean, what your thoughts are on that? Well, I mean, you know, if... Are you talking about, like, man-made technologies and things like that? I'm talking about exotechnology, extraterrestrial mm -hmm. technology, okay. somehow involved with Earth. Because it seems to me we have an economy on Earth, there's an economy going on up there. Yeah, and okay. our underground bases, yeah. there's an economy going on down there. So there's, technically, there could be three economies involved with our planet, including one of them being our own. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, some people have talked about alien technology that we might be in our hands, you know, but for economic reasons um, or to basically keep the status quo and the world as it is, decisions are being made not to give the, to, for this technology to be given to the rest of us. Um, in other words, you know, um, the idea that the world could be made much better with technologies that are being hidden from us. Um, and the reason why is it being hidden? Well, economies, you know, oil, um, the, the stability of the planet. Um, you know, for example, let's say that there really are highly advanced technologies being developed, let's say Area 51, and that a decision has been made not to put that in the public domain. But then somebody decides, yes, we will. You know, there's this battle going on behind the scenes. Well, imagine if overnight all of the Middle Eastern oil providing countries were bankrupted overnight because of the introduction of something completely new. Well, you only have to look at the, the state of the Middle East at the best of times, never mind when we bankrupt every single one of them. Um, that could easily spiral over into, you know, a localized war and a bigger war and a bigger war. Um, so I think there's that aspect to it. A lot of people don't think of how it could impact on the economy. Now, the other angle, of course, which a lot of people sort of adhere to, is the like the secret space program um, issue of is someone actually, you know, flying or using this technology? Have they been back to the moon? Have they been to Mars? I mean, if you think about it, today. You know, we actually don't have, um, you know, a manned space uh, mission uh, or project in the U.S. anymore. You know, the the, the last time that, you know, Ameri the United States launched um, spacecraft with crews on, which were totally American, with the with the space shuttles. Today, we've got the International Space Station, but we're in this state where you know, that we have to sort of go, we get piggybacked on, on Russian rockets. That's how that we get to the International Space Station now. 
Now, people say, well, how can we have just done all this stuff, like going to the moon, sending probes to Mars, the space shuttle, and not really have done any more? And we've just kind of stopped, or it's just sort of folded up a bit. Well, maybe it hasn't. Maybe there really is some sort of secret space program which has this technology, whether acquired by aliens or whatever, and they really have been back, and that might explain why it seems like we've just dropped it all. But maybe somebody hasn't. Maybe even NASA don't know. Maybe it's some really deeply buried program that even NASA doesn't realize that they're competing with, an, with another organization that's way in advance. Um, you know, um, th there's all sorts of aspects, you know, that could have an impact on us in ways that we don't think about, you know, we kind of tend to focus on, well, what if aliens attack us like in Independence Day? But, you know, if you looked at it from the other angles, um, how it could affect economy, how that could cause wars, you know, um, countries and corporations would be affected and um, I wouldn't be surprised if somebody, you know, some sort of think tank type group has put together papers saying we can't put this into the public domain because it's going to cause too much of a shake-up. So. Okay. Has anyone got a closer look at these black helicopters with a drone or some other method? <laughs> That's probably not a bad idea actually, I didn't think of that. But um, a lot of people have taken photographs of the black helicopters and in many cases they are um, completely black without markings. Um, Betty Andreessen, a well-known abductee, she took a number, uh, her and her uh, husband Bob, they took a number of photographs um, of various types of military helicopters near their home. And um, so, you know, all we can really say is that someone's flying them and they seem to have the ability, not just the ability, but the legal right to fly them um, without markings. And, um, you know, it'd be interesting to try and, for someone to do like a project that would allow, um, you know, to, to dig further into this angle and really try and figure out who's flying them, you know, who's giving them permission, where are they taking off from, that would be an interesting thing. Did you have a question? I have a black helicopter story in that respect, which I think you might find. Okay. All right. These three were commissioned to me and my late ex-wife, or a doctor, and still say, um, Paris, in Connecticut, to the Hickory Apache uh, reservation there in order to investigate the stories of Paul and others that I get out of a company called the LC in Mexico. And when we were there, one of the things that we did... I'm oh, sorry, did you say Dulce, New Mexico? Yes, oh, I, I, okay. I did originally pronounce it as they did cool thing, okay. Spanish, mm -hmm. which is correct. Um, and um, so uh, one of the first things that we did was we took uh, copies of uh, Benowitz's briefing paper, and we went to the Hickoria Apache Tribal Headquarters. And we met with Mrs. Barbara Martinez, who was the tribal president. And she was very happy to get this literature because she said that they had had a problem with people coming onto the reservation and not showing any respect to the Indians, um, just thinking that they could go around. And she had heard about these papers, and she was very happy to actually get a copy. So in, um, as courtesy to me and Dora, she introduced us to the sheriff, who was um, a very robust, strong, uh, very intelligent man, who uh, gave us a tour. And one of the things that he did is he took us out to an area where um, he said that one day, uh, when he was out on patrol, a black helicopter landed, which had no arms, and six or seven men, all in the yard, all wearing black uniforms with no insignia, got out and formed a perimeter around it with their guns drawn. And he said that he was, you know, extremely startled by this because he was on patrol with one of his um, deputies. And it was as though they were, you know, laying claim to this area right in the middle of the reservation. But then he said as they approached them, they all got back in the helicopter and took off. It was one of the strong, strangest stories mm. that I've ever heard. Um, so uh, for the for the Hickoria, we have a long history of um, visitations by um, strange craft and animal relations in this 
necessary. And this gentleman had personally uh, investigated quite a number of them. Uh, in addition to the uh, uh, tradition of Indian shamanism and shape shifting, uh, the whole thing gets extremely interesting. Mm -hmm. So um, you can find my essay about that. It's called Where the White Man is an Alien. Uh, uh, still online. Just Google it. But it just shows that yeah. there, there, there's something. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, how tall were these figures, like, in uh, the Oh, well, they're ordinary men. I can't even say there's anything wrong about but, but they were all they were all dressed in what looked like standard issue uh, American Army, you know, fatigues. But they have no insignia. Um, they were just they were fatigued. Okay. Um, it's more difficult to to modern uh, to critic critically evaluate modern anecdotal and photographic evidence of paranormal phenomena. Yeah, I mean, it, it can be difficult to sort of analyze, particularly in today's world, you know, where anyone can just, you know, create imagery of anything. Um, so I think, you know, what I always tell people, if you've got something or you, somebody gives you something that's really interesting, work with it and, and sort of investigate it as much as you can but don't just quickly put it on the internet and say here's the proof you know do it sort of carefully and quietly and if it turns out to be great well that's perfect then put it on the internet if it turns out to be garbage well you've learned a lesson before you got yourself into even deep trouble you know and um, why do MIB even try to suppress testimony and, and uh, do you think they must be invited implies a code of conduct? Um, that's, that's interesting. I mean, as I said, there are a lot of these cases where the men in black who, you know, don't look like us, they do look sort of pale and skinny and they wear these black suits and black fedoras. They do kind of look like um, a modern day vampire. And very often they, they have to get the invite to come inside they just sort of stand on the doorstep like this sort of you know robotic and um, so I think you know you could make a case I sometimes wonder if the old legends of vampires um, you know going back hundreds of years could they actually have been like early MIB cases um, but dressed in the fashion of that era you know I mean today sort of like a black suit Maybe, you know, you look back in the old legends of vampires and black cloaks and things like that. Well, maybe, you know, maybe that's, that was how they dressed back then. Maybe it's something that's been with us a long, long time and sort of subtly changed itself a little bit over the years and the, and the centuries. Um, and there's a sort of another vampire parallel as well. People like Albert Bender, who <coughs> saw the, or had the M MIB appear in their rooms, started to feel like e ill and sick and weak as if they were being drained of their life force whereas vampires in the old legends drain people of their blood so again maybe that's sort of um, another aspect where the vampire legends might have come from you know the, the sort of energy draining MIB which as I said you know this is nothing to do with the government or the DOD or anything like that for me at least it's it's something that verges on the paranormal but the more you dig into the world of ufology you do find a lot of para, um, paranormal parallels you know and um, and things that don't fit in well in in just with the people who think it's all just nuts and bolts craft and aliens from here or from that star and I think that's one of the problems with a lot of the sort of old guard within ufology going back to the 50s and 60s is that a lot of them don't want to embrace these sort of stranger aspects of the subject. They want like, the good old days of um, things like the day the earth stood still and earth versus the flying saucers and things like that. They don't want to deal with these issues like where, for example, people have taken psychedelics and interacted with the greys um, in like an altered state. Or you have cases where people start to have really weird synchronicities in relation to UFO cases and I think I, th I think you know it's kind of like like you 
no disrespect to anybody's age at all, but somebody has like an elderly grandmother who just will not have an iPhone because it intimidates her, you know. There are people are like that, you know. Sometimes people don't want to sometimes deal with new technology. They feel kind of um, wary of it or it intimidates them. That does happen. And I sometimes think with ufology that happens, that the old guard don't want to go down these weirder paths. And I think the weirder paths could actually provide us the answers. You know, there's, there's no point just collecting more and more reports of UFO sightings, because that, all that does is tell us the phenomenon still existing. We need to find a way to interact with these things in a way that is going to give us the answers. And I think there are some people in ufology who just, they don't want that. They just want tales of crashed UFOs and dead aliens and things like that. And they don't want the, the, the more esoteric side, which I think is where we're going to find the answers. So. To understand their agenda, what their agenda, the extraterrestrial agenda is, I think is well, yeah. a step in this phenomenon. Mm -hmm. Well, we come here tonight expecting lots and lots of answers. Instead, we're getting lots and lots more questions. <laughs> well, that's true. Yep, you're right. <laughs> that, but that's good because that gives us an outlook about things and we can kind of surround things with, with uh, questions and maybe get a few answers here. Well, it'll also teach us to dig in places we don't normally dig in. There's so much here to learn yet that we don't know. Mm. And it's amazing what we don't know in this whole area. But it's also very interesting. Hell, I'm 86 and I'm still interested in all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> and it's still fascinating what we've got to learn. And it's really invigorating too, for that matter. You've told us an awful lot about what we do. Well, well thanks. Well, well, I think that's very important. Well, thanks. I mean, it's like I said, I mean, we've only got a couple of minutes, but like I said at the beginning, I'd rather share information than shove it down your throats and say, this is it. You know, in all honesty, I don't know what they are and I don't know what they want, but I do know there's a real phenomenon which interacts with us on a really deep personal level. It's not like people f assume it's going to be, you know, we're all going to wake up one morning and there's UFOs above us. They, they go direct to us, but they do it in a, in a really odd way. Mm -hmm. There's another and some question. of the UFOs, they, some kind of have, have good guys and bad guys? Well, yeah, I mean, I don't think the phenomenon sort of... Um, they're not even related? Well, still. yeah, I guess it could be, you know, sort of all different ones coming from different places with different agendas but I mean like Star Trek. yeah yeah um, but I mean for the for the most part you know we've never been quote invaded you know but then again they've never sort of shown us how to deal with this issue or overpopulation or global warming or give us the cure for cancer or anything like that you know that's not happened so but does that mean that evil? No, it may just be that they're sort of self-serving. Yeah. Well, were you implying that different aspects that you talked about were from different realms, so to speak, not just confined to third dimension in a box or something? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of cases where, you know, UFOs have just appeared out of nowhere, you know, not just flying through the sky, or people have seen these entities walking through walls and things like that. Um, you know, and, and just the fact that there are so many encounters and they occur, you know, in, in the dead of night and things like this, um, it makes me almost think they're sort of coming through like portals or doorways rather than that star or that star. You know, maybe they, they're alien in the sense that they're not human, but maybe they're alien in the sense that they coexist with us. And they simultaneously. Yeah. Yeah, kind of, you know, like today, things like quantum physics are allowing for the existence of different realms of existence. You know, the, the easiest analogy, you know, you're driving in the, down the, in the highway in the car, you don't like the music that's playing, so you turn to another channel and another. All these channels are all going on at the same time, but you can only be tuned into one at any time. So I think it could be something like that, you know, rather than 
you know, alien alien rather than extraterrestrial alien. So. Mm -hmm. There's another written question oh. there that um, I feel strongly about. Um, it's been suggested in the past that um, there have been visitors from other parts of the universe mm -hmm. that came to help us evolve or make a leap mm -hmm. in our evolution. And this does seem to be a significant time paradigm shift. Mm -hmm. Um, global consciousness because of technology, etc. There are a whole lot of major things happening. Do you have any sense, based on, for instance, John Mack's work, whom you haven't mentioned, the psychiatrist who mm -hmm. interviewed a lot of abductees, they all seem to have a message about, that seem to, um, the abductees uh, were told how to take better care of our mm -hmm. planet. Do you have any sense of how you feel this might be a pressure on us or a suggestion to us. I mean, maybe we're a special gene pool in this room mm. that, and we are, we are somehow attuned to something unusual to even be in this room and listen to you. So are we somehow being, is, it, is there a suggestion for our evolution here in your opinion? Well, yeah, I mean, when, when you mentioned about, you know, um, sort of teaching us and, and things like that, or sharing information. Um, the one thing we know for sure they don't do is they don't sort of land and demand we do this and demand we do that. It very much is like a personal thing where the image of something um, is, in, is sort of almost implanted into the person's mind to where, as I said, a lot of abductees, you know, they become vegetarian or they take part in different causes you know, and they start to have concerns about the planet and, and the future. Um, as if, almost as if the thought has been implanted in them. Um, and so the, the problem is from our perspective, I think a lot of people don't often think about, is that whatever this phenomenon is, it either chooses not to or cannot contact, have contact with us in the way we would expect. You know, it's like, um, they, like if we're having a conversation right now, it's almost if the phenomenon is, isn't capable of doing that or chooses not to. And so they do it in a way that is so weird to us that we have to try and almost learn a, a new way of contacting them. You know, it's not like Star Trek, you know, you land on the planet and everybody talks English. <laughs> and, um, and they think like us and everything's just like us. You know, I mean, aliens are probably, it's, you know, it's trying to describe, I mean, it's like if you've got a pet dog, everybody who's got a pet dog knows how clever dogs are and how many words they know. But you cannot teach a dog the concept of what you, the TV is. You know, the dog might look at the TV now and again and watch it even. Um, but you, you haven't got a chance of explaining what it actually is. And I think there's like a degree of that. They're so alien to us that they have to find a different way to contact us and sometimes it works maybe but sometimes it seems like they're in the background but maybe they don't know how to deal with us in the foreground. Yeah. I'm getting a signal from one of the sources. Uh, I, I know that you've got a lot more questions. He's going to stick around for at least a little while, I think, yeah. and you, uh, I'm sure uh, uh, we can ask him more questions. I'd like to thank Nick for... for All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.